Major listed power companies are throwing billions at the race to get New Zealand's to 100% renewable electricity. Who's set to win and potentially lose? It's a once in a generation transition where there are billions of dollars going in. I, I wouldn't isolate it to TY anymore. I think what's important is that we see the demand growth. There's always a risk of both undersupply and oversupply in any period of time. The one thing you can say with certainty, electricity, we will grow. It's Friday the 15th of September and you're watching Markets with Madison. Our major listed power companies are set to spend $30 billion on one of the largest infrastructure transitions the world's ever seen. They're building wind, solar and geothermal power plants in a rush to make our country one of the first to have 100% renewable generation. New Zealand generates around 43,500 gigawatt hours of power every year. It's all made by four power companies, Mercury, Meridian, Genesis and Contact. They operate under a mixed ownership model, meaning they're mostly government owned but also partially listed on our exchange except for Contact, which has no government majority stake. Every year, about 80% of our power comes from renewable sources, like hydro, geothermal and wind. That's pretty high compared to the OECD's 30% renewable. But the current government's aim is to get us to 100% renewable generation by the year 2030, as consumers and companies want more of it. Our use of non-renewable sources like gas and coal has declined significantly since the early 2000s and is expected to continue to as industrial users like Fonterra and New Zealand Steel shift away from coal boilers and more consumers switch to electric vehicles. Our power companies see that shift, so they're getting ahead of it. Their total spend on renewables projects is set to cost $30 billion by the year 2050. That's equal to the total market capitalisation of all of our listed power companies combined. The project set to come online by 2030 would bring 11,700 gigawatt hours to New Zealand's energy grid. About half of that is wind, a third geothermal, and the rest solar. New Zealand's transition is world leading, but also costly. So how are these companies allocating this much shareholder value so confident it's going to pay off? How much will demand need to increase to use all of that additional supply? Well, Contact Energy's Chief Executive Mike Fuge has worked in the energy industry for decades. He's seen it all, from the switch to natural gas to the closure of the refinery in Northland. In this interview, he explains why he's so bullish on this rush to renewables. Mike, thanks for your time. Good to see you. Good to be here. Thank you. Research shows that you've got just over 5,000 gigawatt hours coming online from all of your renewable projects through to the year 2030. That's across geothermal, wind and some solar as well. How many billions of dollars is that in value committed? Um, the, in the order, so if you think of Tohara is 1.4, that's about 800 million. So it's going to cost us in the order of three to four billion dollars all up um, over the full period of, 30, of uh, up to 2030. And who's going to have to pay for that? Is that shareholders or is it consumers? In our base plan, which we put out to shareholders, um, we're very clear that um, we actually think with the current capital settings um, that we've got with the current balance sheet, um, we can um, build out that um, pipeline w um, without um, with the current debt settings. We're absolutely confident of that. So that's the supply picture. Yep. What's the demand picture that you're forecasting in terms of industrial and consumer consumption that's giving you confidence that it's worth spending three and a half billion bucks on? So the first thing is, the first stage of that is thermal replacement. So we're not relying on new demand. We're actually retiring TCC. We've already retired to RAPA. So um, in some ways, it's a bet both ways. We can retire thermal plant. The second thing that we're seeing, we're relying on growth of about in the market, which is in line with the, Commerce, uh, sorry, the Climate Change Commission of about 2% per annum. We expect though that um, if anything, it's going to go faster um, we, because when you have these transitions are never linear, they tend to, everyone looks, they don't happen and then suddenly they do happen. And it's things like the New Zealand Steel deal, which is just the blue scope of now taking FID 
and we expect that to be running up in the next two and a half years. It's things like that you say, actually, it's happening, it's happening now. So industrial seems like it's more key in your demand picture rather than consumer consumption. Um, we've, I've always, as you know, had a passion for um, making sure that industrial New Zealand made that transition. And so getting the industries across through the transition has been a key focus. So, so major industrials, whether they're meat processors, um, dairy, aluminium, steel, making sure those industries make the transition and survive and thrive is actually key because that will put New Zealand in a phenomenal competitive advantage as we come out the other side. Um, we do see the mass market growth, um, obviously with the electrification, with electric cars, um, with the conversion of gas boilers into heat pumps and the like, we obviously see that opportunity as well. And we'd like all Kiwis to join on that transition, but the big focus was to make sure that this transition was a good transition and that it, the opposite didn't happen where people just, rather than transition, they just shut down because it was too difficult. So say industrial take up is complete, they all do it, right? Fonterra, New Zealand Steel, they all make that transition, which is great for your demand picture. But how much is left for consumers then to pick up? Do we all need, say, two Teslas each? Like, what does that actually look like? Our expectation, so I think the mass market retail is about 20 terawatt hours now. We expect the total market is about 40. Um, the conservative estimate on where that goes by 2030, 2035 is 55 terawatt hours. Um, the more optimistic or aggressive estimates it have that going to 80 terawatt hours by 2050. So the one thing you can say with certainty, electricity, we will grow. It will grow. And so in the context of those growth numbers, you know, that enormous five terawatt hours, which we talked about, suddenly looks quite modest. Um, and so the whole idea of the program we're on was build out the geothermal, because that is really high quality um, and base load, and then get some muscle strength around building solar and wind. So on that spectrum, you'd put yourself on the more, more sort of aggressive bullish end, would you, Mike? We, we are privileged with some of the best development opportunities um, of any company in New Zealand. And so all we're doing is building those outstanding opportunities, particularly in geothermal, um, in their merit order. Um, that partly good luck, it's partly a credit to the teams who have developed those, um, those opportunities when the market wasn't so bullish. Um, now the opportunity is, can we go further? I think any Gen Taylor CEO would probably say something similar though, right? They're all doing it. Mercury, Meridian, Genesis, they're all putting billion dollars down on these renewables projects. The research shows me that there's nearly 12,000 gigawatt hours coming from them and you and some other players like Tilt as well, online through to 2030. Can you all win? It comes down to the quality of the project. So if you think of the geothermal, we have already committed um, 1.1, 1.2 billion on Tohara and Tohoka 3. Um, we will replace Wairaki. It's 60 years old. It's time um, it did some, we, we, we built something different there. And so that will happen. That's, you know, it's all but committed. Um, then the competition renews again. We have Tahara Stage 2, which is still that high quality geothermal and fully firmed. And the ability of companies to get those projects up, up and running will depend on their individual project economics. And so it may be that not all of that 10 to 12 terawatt hours which you talked about is built. Um, but what I can be pretty confident of is the best projects within that 12 terawatt hours will be built. And that's where competition is so important that we are competing hard to make our projects the very best so they do get away. Yeah, this is interesting, right? Not all of these projects, in fact, most of them, the final investment decision, the FID, so it's called, hasn't actually been made, right? No. It's been committed on paper and in press release, yes. but not necessarily on land, right? For example, your wind project doesn't actually have resource consent, is that correct? No, it's in for fast track resource consenting. It is now, okay. Yes, okay, so if you take the maturity, the geothermal, we have resource consent, able to go. Um, we just need to get the developments underway. And that's the, where the really hard work um, happens, as we've discovered over the last four years. So what's that dependent on? Is that dependent on you seeing that demand picture play out, or is it dependent on TY? No, for the geothermal, it's, it's solely... Sorry, I mean for all of your renewables projects, for, including for, wind for, and solar. Yeah, for, so um, 
I, I wouldn't isolate it to TY anymore. I think what's important is that we see the demand growth, um, that we can see those signals. Obviously, TY or a major industrials exiting would put a dampener on that. I think the analysis now says it's much less of a dampener than it was assessed to be three years ago. But um, TY staying would mean, yes, there would be pressure to go faster. As it stands, though, as we've sort of agreed that there is this amount committed via press release, but not everyone's necessarily going to do it. Say there becomes a time and a place where they do go ahead with some of it, but not potentially all of it. Is there still there a potential case for oversupply? I think there's, that's the wonderful thing about a free market. There's always a risk of both undersupply and oversupply in any period of time. It always corrects. Um, and you've seen that, for instance, in the Australian market and some of the other international markets where they, there's a rush, they build, and then suddenly everyone pulls back. I think the risk in New Zealand is that there is potential for overbuild of particular types of intermittent generation. Think mm -hmm. overbuild of solar, overbuild of wind. But all that means is that when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing, that the cost of firming that will be much higher. And that's where the balanced portfolio, the geothermal, um, having wind and solar in different parts of the island, having potentially batteries, having significant hydro, all of those add up to, in a, from a portfolio perspective, we're kept safe. So that's why you're doing it all? That's why, that's why we're building the geothermal first, and that's why the second part of it, that's why we're renewing the pi pipeline with solar and wind, um, and that's why we're also looking at batteries to stand alongside our hydro. Part of the economics of solar is that you can build it quickly. Mm, and cheap, right? Cheaper than something else, than wind, for example. No, actually no? wind is cheaper than solar in New Zealand. Those turbines are huge. Transporting them alone would cost millions. <laughs> yeah, per megawatt, it is cheaper, but per megawatt hour, ah. because it's not like this every day, um, and our capacity factors are much lower than, say, Australia or Chile or other parts of the world. And so the opportunity with solar is with the forward curve very healthy at the moment, is to build and build quickly. That's the opportunity in solar, is that it's relatively straightforward to build. The opportunity with wind is that one, it complements solar, but it is got a capacity factor north of 42% rather than at 22%. And geothermal, of course, 95%. Geothermal, though, isn't no emissions, it's low emissions. So is there a risk of you taking on something that's low emitting? Abs absolutely not, because um, we've cracked, particularly with Wairaki and Tohara, um, we've found a way to keep the CO2 in the process. So um, it's not capturing CO2, it's just keeping the CO2 dissolved in the water, in the water, and then re-inject. And that's actually one of the exciting things about the last two years. We thought it was low emissions, and then one of our um, operations engineers, um, senior engineers, um, said actually you can just, if we put a pipe in and capture it, it can be re-injected. We tried it and it worked. And what that means is that both Tohara and Wairaki have a chance to be gross emission zero, which is um, huge. The other opportunity on CO2 for Ohaki, which we're excited about, is that New Zealand's actually short of CO2. Um, with the closure of the refinery. Beer. We need it for beer, don't we? <laughs> Unlike the English, we like our beer with fizz, not flat beer. Um, and we prefer it to be cold. And so the opportunity with Ohaki, which is probably one of our worst assets, is that it is high CO2 emitting. It is relatively pure CO2, the, stream, the CO2 stream. So there is an opportunity to capture that, clean it up, and convert it to CO2. New revenue stream. You could compete with Todd Energy. Well, exactly. And so instead of getting, let's say, 60 to $70 a ton credit for putting it back in the ground, you can earn $500 a ton and you turn a scope one emission into a scope three emission. And the beauty of it is it's actually then a sustainable source of CO2 because it's not dependent in any way, form or fashion on hydrocarbons. It's happening anyway. How would you describe 
the scale of investment that's going into renewables. This is billions of dollars that numerous companies are throwing at one transition. It's, it's quite crazy, would you agree? The way I think of it, I got into the industry during the gas transition. If you think of 1970s with the discovery of Maui and Kapuni and what New Zealand went through an enormous energy transition there, it went from fuel oil and coal heating effectively along with hydro to gas. This is the same. It's a once in a generation transition where there are billions of dollars going in, but the technology is there and we're able to do it. So why not be part of it? And when we look back in the year 2030, we'll say it all worked out, do you think, Mark? I think absolutely we'll say it all worked out. Well, there'll be some surprises on the way. Um, there'll be mis mistakes made. But I think we'll say that um, just particularly with New Zealand, particularly with its um, free market, free energy market, that you'll find that people have come up with some wonderfully creative solutions. So yeah, I'm absolutely confident. If you think of the creativity in that carbon capture solution, that's the thing that gets me really excited. Imagine that multiplied a thousand fold over the next 15 years with people coming up with these creative solutions again and again and again. And that's why at the moment where people see, well, we can't solve for dry year risk, those problems, those risks will be solved very quickly and very at very low cost. Mike, thank you for your time. Good to see you. Thank you, Madison. I want to know what you think of this renewables race. Are they rushing too quickly into it or are our gen tailors not moving fast enough? One thing that I find really interesting is that not all of the billions they've talked about is actually completely committed. That final investment decision is yet to be made for many of them. So we could actually see some projects ditched from here. I'll keep you posted if they are. Now go put your money to work. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel to stay up to date with all the latest news from the New Zealand Herald. Click the subscribe button below or check out one of the videos here and head over to nzherald.co.nz for more details on these stories and more.